Hi, everyone, and welcome to our presentation today. Uh, we're going to be talking about Docker Data Center for AWS. I'm Chris Hines, and I'm joined today with Harish Jayakumar. So, Harish, thanks for being here. Thank you. Thanks for having me, Chris. Um, so, as we always do, before we kick things off today, I want to remind everyone that um, today's presentation is being recorded. So, you'll have the opportunity to give it another watch if you'd like. What we'll do is we will send it out in an email probably Monday or Tuesday of next week, so keep an eye out for that. Um, and you can rewatch the entire recording. You can share it with anyone that you like as well. Also, towards the end of this presentation, we'll make sure to host a live um, Q&A session so you have an opportunity to ask some questions to Harish and myself. Um, you can feel free to post questions throughout the presentation as they come up. Um, just know that we won't be actually addressing them towards the end for about the last 15 minutes or so. Um, so that being said, I think we can kind of dive right into it. So first off, I want to say that uh, DockerCon is coming up. So DockerCon is our big user conference. Um, you know, a lot of our tech leaders here at the company are going to be giving keynotes. We'll have use cases from customers. We do technical deep dives. We do uh, hands-on labs. A lot of great stuff, and we actually have a lot of a lot of fun in the process of that. Um, um, just to say thanks for y'all being here, I want to extend a special promo code to you. All you got to do is go to register. You can just um, Google DockerCon 2017, or you can use the link here um, and put in the promo code HINES, and you'll receive 10% off. All right, so that's just a quick thank you for uh, taking the time to be here on this webinar. But on to Docker and Docker Data Center, right? So uh, we actually performed a survey uh, last year of 500 IT application um, team members. It's a mix of IT ops as well as developers. And what we found was that Docker is really at the center of three key enterprise initiatives that are taking place today. Um, the first key component is application modernization. So a lot of enterprises like um, that you might be working at today or they have these uh, more traditional applications that they're looking to containerize and benefit from things like portability and reduce costs. Um, we see about three out of four companies that um, use Docker to help them do that when considering containers. Um, in terms of DevOps, right, breaking down that traditional barrier that has existed between um, developers and, and IT operations teams, right, we see about 44% of companies are looking to actually adopt some kind of DevOps culture or strategy within their enterprise today and are looking at Docker to help them do so. And, and the last component is cloud, right? So that's adopting cloud strategies. It could be hybrid cloud, it could be multi-cloud. And we see about 80% of companies that are looking at Docker uh, view it as central to their cloud strategy. So before we talk about Docker Data Center for AWS, I want to first talk about what Docker Data Center is. So this is essentially a supported uh, enterprise container management platform. Right? It has all the pieces that developers as well as IT operations teams require in able to help them build, ship, and then finally run their applications in production. All right, so I'll, I'll show you a quick look at what the actual platform itself looks like. Um, so this is a snapshot of kind of the Docker data center on-premises platform, right? Uh, we sell it as a subscription, think of it as a, a bundle of solutions and, and tools. Um, that are all included here. So first off, you have the Docker engine. Uh, the, the Docker engine is really kind of the heart of it all, right? It's the thing that actually creates and runs the containers. It's the runtime um, with some of the newer releases like 1.12 um, and 1.13, which is coming out in a few weeks. Uh, we have this built-in orchestration component, right? So some of you might have heard of Swarm. Uh, Swarm is our Docker engine clustering tool, right? It essentially makes it really easy to deploy applications across multiple Dockerized nodes, right? And Harish will talk through a little bit about that in a little while and show you kind of what the architecture looks like. Um, also built into the engine are some networking components, uh, the ability to mount volumes as well as plugins. Okay, then you have the actual registry. This is where you store and secure images, right? We have, um, we call this Docker Trusted Registry and it's essentially just secure image management as well as distribution, right? Think of it as a central location for your developers to pull from and your IT ops uh, to also pull from and, and run them in production. And then you have what we call our container management layer or universal control plane. And this is how IT operations team members will actually go out and um, you know, uh, manage, deploy, scale across their environment. Right In this case, we'll be talking about AWS. Um, and then one of the most important factors is security or trust. 
right? Having this kind of end-to-end -end security process and being able to, what we call here is uh, secure the enterprise uh, software supply chain, right? So we have a, a combination of tools, uh, like the ability to sign images to ensure that um, they're untampered with and that you're using the latest version of it. We have um, some pretty in-depth and granular role-based access control, so you can control who has access to what Docker, Docker artifacts in your environment. Um, we have also the ability to um, integrate with things like LDAP and AD, which makes it really, really easy to set up users and groups and then apply role-based access controls to them as well. Um, and as Docker, one of the big things we believe in is batteries included but swappable. So you can see that row at the top there. Those are all the different plugins that we have available. Um, so again, the whole goal here is to actually not ask you to strip out everything that's in the environment, but instead be able to plug in Docker Data Center with them today. So you know, everything from CI, CD, I'll show you a quick look at how we can build out a CI, CD pipeline using Docker, which is a really common use case, uh, at least for folks just getting started with Docker. Um, networking components, we have volumes, configuration management, monitoring, uh, we'll, we'll talk about some of the um, CloudWatch stuff that we can do in terms of um, integration and, and plugins, as well as logging. Um, and then, of course, the infrastructure itself, right? The engine, which I said is really the heart of it all, um, can be deployed in any infrastructure type, right? So that gives you full portability. Um, you're not limited or locked into any specific um, environment. So that can run in the cloud, uh, within a VM, or um, in a physical data center as well. So as I mentioned, CI/CD is uh, one of the first approaches that enterprise teams look at when starting to implement Docker within their company. And if you look at this diagram here, you might be familiar with some of the tools, right? We have GitHub, we have Jenkins, we also have like the developer and the sysadmin on the right side. Um, and I talked about Docker Trusted Registry before, right? And what teams use that as is like the central location, right? Kind of uh, the share point between developers and sysadmin, right? So you have this kind of core set of approved content that's stored within DTR in the form of in images, right? Um, then your developers can pull from this registry to start building their applications. They can do, they can, uh, do a git push, so push to GitHub, and then push from GitHub back into the registry right, to create these new Dockerized applications. In which point, the sysadmin can then pull from that registry and deploy into their environment, whether it be physical or cloud. Right, so if you look at some of the bullets there, we have this kind of started with this trusted and known state being the fact that developers are pulling from the registry itself. And we have a series of uh, security tools like Docker Content Trust, which you can actually sign images on push. And that's kind of the control and approved content aspect, as well as the, uh, the cryptographic signature itself. So uh, once teams have kind of become a little more mature in their um, I would say adoption of Docker, they start to build out something called this Docker Containers as a Service workflow, all right? And if you look at this diagram here, it kind of walks through the build, ship, and run components of the platform, right? So you have the developers, you have IT ops. Um, on the build side, they would use a tool like you know, Docker for Mac or Docker for Windows, which is installed on the developer's uh, worktop or desktop, if you will, um, where they're actually creating these images and then pushing them to the registry. Uh, once that happens, the actual image itself is signed with Docker Content Trust, which gives basically a cryptographic signature so you can who, see who actually created that image. Uh, once it's in the registry itself, the IT operations team can then pull it and run it in production using Universal Control Plane. Um, and as you can see there, you can run um, applications or containerized applications with UCB in the cloud or on-prem, and you have full portability between the two. All right, so you're not locked into using only one specific environment, whether it be a, a cloud provider or on-premise um, or, or on-prem server as well. So what I want to do here is uh, pass it off to Harish, who's going to talk through some of the actual <laughs> Docker data center architecture and then get into um, a demo of Docker data center for AWS. Cool. Thank you very much, Chris. Um, that, thank you very much. Um, for setting it up for me, made it very easier. <laughs> ah, so, hello everybody, um, uh, I'm Harish, uh, the solutions engineer. So, what we'll continue with from where, uh, what we'll continue with from where uh, Chris mentioned is the actual Docker data center architecture. So, Chris talked about UCP and DTR, right? So, the UCP, think of it as your orchestration layer uh, built on top of Docker Swarm, the open source component. 
and DTR is the uh, phase where you actually store your images, right? So basically, let's talk about UCP first. UCP, it's a simple, uh, it works with a manager and worker, right? So master-slave model. So in this picture, you can see I have three managers, um, and that's because I've set it up for high availability, right? And then, so if one of the managers goes down, the cluster is still healthy, it can recover, and uh, make sure the cluster is up and running. Then workers, totally up to you. It depends upon uh, how many of the workers you want to be able to have, right? Uh, so what is the requirement for this? Uh, we don't care if it is a physical server or if it is a VM. As long as there's a Docker engine installed on it, it will work, right? Obviously, this uh, we are restricting here our conversations with respect to Amazon, but I'm just telling you the flexibility of that is something you can use even outside of Amazon. You really don't care where you're running the nodes on. Now, DTR, again, will be managed by UCP, and it runs as an application inside UCP, but it is used to store your images. So if you guys are familiar with what Docker Hub does, which is you know repositories, teams, storing images there, that's what Docker uh, Trusted Registry does, but it's an on-prem version, as in like it's a private, your own repository that you can use. Um, when I say on-prem, it doesn't actually mean that it has to be inside your physical data center. So for example, Amazon, you're having your own private cloud and you can host it there too. So that's the Docker data center architecture. And as you can see, it's a very pluggable architecture, right? So you can use whatever components you already have for logging to be able to use with it. You can use whatever monitoring, you can it has integration with the directory, uh, you can have external CA if you want to be able to use, all that can be used as well. So that's the whole idea with respect to Docker is basically the batteries included but swappable, which is basically says, hey, we are going to give you some confidence and we tell you what is going to be the right way to do it, but if you want to use something outside of it, you should be able to plug in and be able to use it. So here you can see as an administrator, you can log in and manage the entire cluster using the UCP manager, and you can also push and pull images into uh, Docker Trust Registry. Cool. So what is the easiest way for AWS to get started with Docker Data Center is um, to use full Docker Data Center platform with your AWS environment. As you guys saw in the picture above, you saw how many things you actually had to do. Right? Uh, so you have to go set it up on your own. You have to spin up those nodes. You have to install a Docker engine and have it all running on Amazon. Um, it's, it's still easier, but what we thought would be easier is for people to get started is actually have an even easier way, a simple click-through, three or four clicks, and you should have a cluster up and running. Right? And that's what Docker Data Center for AWS does. So let's talk about the architecture. So what we're going to do now is we're actually going to go spin up an entire Docker data center cluster, right? Uh, which is going to consist of three UCPs, or how many ever UCPs you're going to ask it to do. It needs to be either three for HA, we're going to configure it in HA, then it's going to set up the worker nodes, uh, it's going to configure to log in Amazon Cloud Watch, it's also going to be able to have your DTR set with an S3 uh, bucket in the back end. So basically the way we do this is we're going to create one whole VPC, and we're going to have two availability zones across which we're going to distribute the masters. That way, if one of them goes down, you still have the cluster up and healthy up and running, right? Then we're going to configure a UCP load balancer in front of these managers so you can load balance these nodes. We're also going to configure a DTR ELB for, uh, to make sure that your DTR, which follows the same principle for high availability, can also be configured with a load balancer. And we're also going to configure a worker load balancer for the workers. So you have three load balancers, two availability zones, one VPC, um, and that's uh, and then you're going to configure it with logging an S3 bucket. So this, if you have to go do it, it's probably going to take you about 30 to 40 steps to do each of the individual things and go do it. So we've created a cloud formation template which will actually go do this all in just four or five clicks. And that's the demo which I'm going to be showing you right now. So let me share my screen with you so you can uh, get into your demo here. Stop sharing this, pass you the ball, and you have the rights now. 
cool. And, and just so, in case, if you hear something in the background, we're getting some remodels done here at the Docker headquarters in San Francisco. So I apologize in advance for any crazy sounds or loud knocking, banging sounds you hear. Um, actually, it's uh, it's all good. <laughs> Thanks, Chris. So um, this is the architecture um, that we talked about and the cluster that we're actually going to be going ahead and spinning right now. Um, so uh, this uh, we'll actually share all these links at the end of the we'll share all these links at the end of the meeting. Um, but this is the architecture that we shared right now. So you pretty much want to go. There's a launch stack over here, so we're going to start with that. So it's actually going to take you to the cloud formation template. So you can see um, that's the URL to actually go spin up the cluster. Um, then next. So let's see. Webinar. So number of swarm managers. So what is this is basically number of UCP managers is what's being asked here. Um, just a quick thing like what um, uh, Chris mentioned, swarm is the orchestration component that's built into the Docker engine itself. Um, if it's available even on the open source side. But what we heard from, you know, customers was that, hey, we wanted, a, you know, more stuff on top of it, right? I mean, it was just, you know, there was no GUI, there was no Active Directory and LDAP integration, there was no role-based authentication, there was no signing, all those things built in. So we built all that on top of it, and that's called as UCP. So just like we showed, we can stick with three. Number of workers, five seems fine. Medium is okay. Uh, I don't know, let me take medium. So... SSH key, I already have my existing SSH key that I'm going to be able to use. Um, let's say admin, password, right? And now Docker data center license. So uh, how do you get the license? You can actually go to Docker store over here. And uh, if you type, there's, you know, store.docker.com. And if you actually type Docker data center, this page comes up. Um, once you fill this, you're going to get a free license uh, to be using for 30 days for which you can try. I have already uh, kind of done that. So that's my, you can see I just downloaded the license here. So I'm opening up the license. It's, it's a simple JSON file. So I'm just going to copy paste it. Right. Um, key doesn't matter. Harish, say webinar. Um, IAM rule. If you have a specific IAM rule, you have created only for the cloud formation templates. You can absolutely use that. Mine is created as a simple IAM rule with my privileges um, for the uh, uh, AWS itself. So I'm just going to use that one. And it's just asking me for confirmation. Yes, I acknowledge it. And boom. That's it, right? So now it's actually going and it's actually creating the webinar, uh, sorry, it's actually creating an entire cluster, creating those VPCs, creating those availability zones, creating those load balancers, creating the security groups, creating all that out of the box uh, with just those um, things that we actually filled. So let's quick refresh. Uh, all right. Um, what went wrong. So we can just create this. So either the permissions for me have changed or we've updated this one. But that's pretty much the progress you will actually have to do to go create the instance. So what I did is I'm going to bring up the instance that I just created uh, now, the same path that I went through, and we'll come back and look at it. So what it does is at the end of this, when it's fully completed, you will see this. So now it's actually gone and it's created this entire thing. So you can see it created the load balancer. This is the steps it went through. So let's let's walk through this and see what it actually did. So. Now what it actually did is it went, it created the UCP, it created the DTR, and then there you go. It tells me that's my UCP URL, that's my DTR URL, and username. So let's log into my UCP first. There you go. So obviously I, I logged in before, so it's telling me that, uh, you know, basically since I've already logged in, it's showing me that. And now I can also log into my DTR. It's coming up. 
obviously, since I just set it up, uh, it does this. So now let's take a look at this, right? So this is my UCP. It came up, just I all I had to do was spin up those four or five components, and it went and spun it up. So let's, this is basically UCP, which is Universal Control Plane. Uh, this is built on top of Docker Swarm, and it has all those capabilities that's built into it. So as you can see, um, you know, it's a clean, simple interface. It shows you everything and anything that's happening in the cluster, right? It tells me the usage of my nodes. Node is nothing but the, the services, um, which is basically nothing but a VM or a physical server uh, over which you've installed the engine. In my case, obviously, these are EC2 instances. It tells me all the services that are running, all the containers that are running on this, right? Uh, if we go to resources, it tells me how many, what, what are my services that are running, what containers, images, nodes, um, everything about the cluster, right? So what is the service? Um, so starting engine 112, we have created a layer uh, of abstraction above containers, right? Because containers, yes, they're very good, but um, nobody wants to actually deal with them on an independent container basis. You, logically, you think about it, you deal with a group of containers, right? And that's why we created the concept of a service. So for example, I can go click create service. Let's call it uh, test, uh, I like Redis. Now you can actually say how many of those services you want. So it's either one, or you can say two services of that. So it's actually gonna go create two containers in the back end called Harish Test made of uh, the image from Redis. You can use any publish um, labels. I'm gonna skip these. Now, this page is basically for uh, scheduling, right? Now this becomes really important when you're doing things like rolling update. Now say suppose, so obviously I'm gonna spin up two instances right now. Now say suppose I had 10 instances. Now of those 10 instances, I wanna be able to go uh, and update them, say, I don't know, uh, three nodes at a time with a delay of four seconds. Now, what will this do? What this will do is it will update first three containers, wait for four seconds, then update the next three one, wait for four seconds, then update the next three one on this. So this becomes really important when you're doing something like a rolling update or something. So very, very comes very useful according to it. Now what is constraints? Constraints is when you can actually specify things on where you want to schedule these containers. So I can actually say that, hey, I specifically want it on these instances alone. I want it to be only on these uh, nodes. I'm gonna start using the word node instead of instances to make keep it general so you can just understand the concept, but, but you guys get it. I want it, for example, if I have a constraint, I'm added on a node which says, okay, I have a node only made up of SSD drives, you can add the constraint to say, okay, throw it only onto that node and UCP will do it for you, right? Then you have any ports you wanna be able to publish. Here you can actually go specify how much CPU, memory limitations you wanna be able to set on it. And then you can actually go add any labels or add any environment variables. Okay, I'm gonna keep it simple for now and simply do a deploy now. And as you can see, it automatically went and created that service. Uh, showing red because obviously it's taking time for both the containers to get spun up. So once that finishes, it'll, it'll go back to, uh, it'll become green. We'll, we'll come back there. Uh, so this tells you over here now, we're going into the containers page, which is gonna tell you all the containers that are there. So as you can see here, these are all the containers that are spun up. Each of them is an individual container. Obviously, these were containers that were created because we just kicked off the CloudFormation template, but if you have an application running, it'll probably have your application containers that are up and running over there, right? Um, then you go to logs, it tells you all the logs that are available for the container. Stats, it tells you how much CPU memory utilization is going on in that specific container. And then you click on console. Now, this is really cool. You can actually go and you see there, you can, you're actually into the container right now. Uh, so for people who are actually familiar with the CLI and, and the, uh, in the container world, you can actually understand that this is uh, what you do when you do like a Docker exec, right? You, when you do a Docker exec on a container and you, you know, throw, in a, throw in a shell prompt on it, you can actually get into the container and that's what this is actually showing. Uh, so I'm disconnecting for now on this one. Let's go back over here. Uh, there you go. You see there, our two services just came up uh, and they're healthy and running. Now, you also have the concept of scaling over here, so I can actually go schedule, and I can say, okay, you know what, I probably need four instances of this, so I'm just gonna scale it up over here, um, and then it's gonna get more. So it's gonna say save, and then you can say that it's updating the service, and you can actually have uh, four uh, services up and running. 
while this is coming up, um, because this is um, based on the template, I wanted to also show, uh, talk about some of the cool things. We, I'm going to kind of shift gears just to talk a little bit on some of the cool things that you can actually do over here. Now, this is the template you've already done, right? It barely took 10 to 15 minutes to have this entire thing up and running. Now, what's actually happening is it's also connected to, uh, to autom uh, so the, the, the big question I kept getting asked is, okay, does this auto scale with respect to ASGs, right? Amazon scaling groups. Absolutely, yes. So we have separate um, um, scaling groups for the workers and for the master as well. So you can actually go to the scaling group for your workers and you can increase the number of nodes if you want to, or you can actually even go here and from here, you can actually even do an update of the stack, right? So you can say you can create the change set or you can do an update stack over here. That's fine, just use the current template. All the things remain as is, right? I wanna read my password. And then here I am, I'm keeping all these things specifically, right? So here, we have three nodes and seven, right? Now say suppose we wanna increase this to nine. That's it. So you can actually go update, or if you want to increase the managers. By the way, managers can be only odd numbers. They have to be either three or five, or uh, I mean, in the, in the cloud formation right now, we are, we are supporting up to five. You can also have seven. But after that, you know, it's going to be a point of diminishing returns. So you can actually update it to nine, and then that's it. When you keep going, two nodes are going to come up uh, automatically, and everything is going to be configured for you. So this is a very, very flexible uh, thing for you to be able to go use it, right? Now you can also, if you want SSH to the nodes, um, what we do is we, you can actually SSH into the actual master. So if you actually want to go see what's happening, just to show you. By the way, that's the um, IP of the instance. I can show you if you don't see that. Because we did that, it went and spun up all those instances, so I just to save time, I had the IP of the master up and ready. Uh, so I'm actually logging into the master now, right? That's the manager. So we're gonna log into that guy. Right, so you can see here, I used the key that I used, and now I'm actually into the master, and now if I actually do a dot yes, you can actually see all the containers that were involved in making. This is all that happened in the background. The bootstrapper got, actually, I keep getting, uh, yeah, I think that should be able to see. So I've done right now is I've actually SSH to the actual master and I can see all the containers that are running. So now if you wanna have, obviously, I'm an administrator and I've done that. Uh, you cannot directly SSH to the worker nodes in case of this, that's how we've set it up. Um, it's just a security practice that we're following. Uh, what you can do though is you can SSH to the master and from the master you can actually SSH to the actual uh, uh, worker nodes. So that's some background on the setup that we've done in the, in, in the back end. Uh, let's go back to UCP over here, right? Um, so we had nodes here and the nodes have been, so it shows all the seven nodes. Obviously I didn't click accept over there, um, but you know, all the nodes over here are listed over here. So you can go into each individual node as well and it tells you everything that's happening with respect to that node. So you can see here, it says it's a healthy worker, sans how much CPU it's using. Uh, that's the version of the Docker engine that's being used. Uh, what are the tasks that are running on that and any logs which are associated with that as well, right? Uh, so, uh, then obviously networks. So uh, with Docker, you have the concept of overlay network, um, which is, is super powerful when you're writing applications and you wanna configure your network. So obviously the same concept of networking, overlay network basically means we don't care what the underlying network is. So you can see here internally in our product itself, we're creating an overlay network over here and some of the bridge networks are also gonna be used over here, right? Now application, for example, you can actually simply even go deploy uh, applications over here like a compose file. So everybody knows compose, so you can actually drop in a compose file as is and you can have an application that's deployed over here, right? Um, so the other thing I really wanted to kind of point out is the concept of UCP bundle. Right, this is super cool by the way. Um, so here is a client bundle. So one of the big feedbacks that we kept 
we got was, um, hey, uh, the biggest challenge when it comes to you know using stuff with customers is, I'm an administrator. I am giving some uh, privileges to my uh, to my internal customers or external customers. Um, how do we handle this whole key management, right? I create these keys. I got to transfer these keys. He has to throw those keys. He has to have, make sure he have to trust it and stuff. So we made it very very simple. Obviously, I've logged in as an administrator, but you know. I, um, Oh, I should show you before I jump onto that. You can create multiple users. See, there's read-only users, read-write users, or you can also integrate them to your Active Directory and LDAP inside your organization, so you can pull the users right from there, right? So for each user, this client bundle that's created, when they log in and they go here and they download this client bundle, it's going to be a different bundle that, that gets created. So I've already downloaded this for this webinar, and I'm gonna show you what are the contents of that. Uh, if you see here, where did I have that? Actually, we can exit this. Okay, should be able to see my screen. Um, so you see this, that is the bundle. As you can see, I downloaded from the Docker Data Center one. Um, I unzipped it, right? And then these are the components that it actually generated. So all these, other than the key, uh, other than harish.pem, which was my SSH key, these are all the keys that are generated. So the cert.pem, the cert.pem, all those things have been connected, right? So what I'm gonna do now is a simple, now I've basically ported the, oh, uh, I think this will help you guys. So here's what it actually goes and does, right? So it's basically setting up your TLS, uh, exporting the certificates, and then configuring your client to talk to the actual node, right? So once you do that, if I do a Docker PS now, you're actually talking and it's actually telling you, by the way, remember now we are outside of the SSH, right? I'm a simple client and depending on the privileges that I have, I can see everything over there. So I know I showed you guys like a simple provision using um, using the CLI, uh, sorry, using the web GUI. Uh, for people who also want to use the CLI, you can. So for example, you can do a simple, the same service that we created over here, Again, I'm copy pasting just to save time. So all that I'm doing is the pretty much what I showed you guys on the GUI, right? Docker service create, I'm calling it demo. I'm exposing it on these ports. That's the name of the image. And so now if you do a Docker service LS, it tells you the services that have been created for the specific node. So you guys remember this one, this is what we created. And then there is a demo um, that we've actually created on well. So let's actually go back to the GUI, and you should see that under services. See, it's uh, coming up right now while we spin through this. Uh, and then once it's ready, you can actually go launch it, and you'll have the component up and ready on this. Right. Cool. So that's, um, so that's the things with respect to uh, the uh, with respect to services. Uh, now let's talk about uh, some of the, uh, see what happened here. Yeah, it should be okay, yeah. Okay, so next thing is, we, let's go and talk in something about the admin settings, right? Now I'm wearing the hat of an administrator over here. Uh, it tells you all the certificates uh, that you want to be able to use. Obviously, that it, co it comes with a built-in CA, but you can also use an external CA if you want. Um, logging is a question I get asked all the time. Again, back to what Chris and I were talking about, the whole pluggable model is here. You can actually simply point this to any remote syslog server. So for example, large organizations maybe already have an Elk stack running. They probably already have Splunk configured. They want to be able to have all those things to be piped into that one. So you can actually use that from here. Right, um, and then you can use debug, info, notice, warning, any of those things and actually go set it over here. What we've done with the AWS template is actually, we've actually configured it to actually go to CloudWatch. So you can actually use CloudWatch, which is in your existing. If you go to CloudWatch, you can actually see that we've also configured this entire cluster to log it to CloudWatch for you. You can use, if you're using outside of Amazon or if you're using just Amazon on your own and you still wanna be able to plug it to your uh, uh, UCP uh, to your own uh, logging outside of the template when you do this, 
you can use something else that you want, an Elk stack or something. Authentication, like I said, this is managed, or you can go to LDAP. So now if you can have multiple groups and you can go pick up whatever groups you want to be able to do, set it up for you. Um, DTR, and we'll be going through this. As you can see, this is the URL for the DTR that we configured, and that's the, that's the next component we're going to be looking right after this. Um, Docker Trusted Registry is the on-prem registry. It comes integrated. Here's the license we actually imported. Um, you can actually get usage uh, reporting over here. Um, and then here's your scheduler. So now if you want to actually go say things like, okay, I um, do not want my application containers to be deployed onto my controllers. Once you check this, it will basically, you can actually make sure that they can deploy it on UCP controllers or not. So you're basically uncheck this and then it's not gonna let you deploy it on UCP controllers or on ETR. Content trust is important. So I'm gonna talk about this pretty, pretty quickly on this and I'll tell you why this run signed images it becomes important. Routing mesh, um, it says experimental, but we've, the, the, the next release that's coming out in a week and a half has actually, it's exiting experimental and it's become, um, it's, it's gonna be showing there. This is super cool, right? Um, as most of you know, or if you don't know, um, the, the Docker engine actually comes with a built-in load balancer called routing mesh. What routing mesh means is it basically doesn't matter, suppose you have a thousand node cluster, it doesn't matter where the container is running in that node. If you reach a node, or if you hit a node that does not have that container, it will automatically direct you to where the container is running. So, and that's a super cool concept, and that's the thing that was actually added in the Docker engine itself. Um, that is, I mean, we're basically using IPVS from the uh, Linux kernel to do that. What we built on top of it, and that is unique to UCP, is the concept of a HTTP routing mesh. Because the engine, what it does is still, it does at a layer four, right? So it only does like layer four routing. This, just think of this as an L7. So it is a HTTP routing mesh. So now I can actually have harish.com and configure that, and then the UCP cluster will actually direct it to it. So this is again a really, really cool thing that we've actually built in and a big differentiator as well compared to what they're um, uh, outside. Now, cluster configurations, uh, so you can actually specify uh, strategies and configure your ports over here. So a lot of the times people ask me questions like, hey, what about what about scheduling? How do you schedule um, containers? How do you want the manager to communicate uh, the scheduling of uh, the containers and services? Well, we support uh, three different categories over here. So spread basically means spread my containers evenly across the nodes. So in our case, what did we have? We had seven, eight nodes, seven nodes. It will spread it evenly across those seven nodes as and when new containers and services start coming. Bin pack basically means to, you know, fill up one container, uh, fill up one node till it completely exhausts out of it. And then random basically means, you know what, I don't care. As long as you find uh, space, go ahead and schedule the containers on it, right? So that's the uh, UCP piece. Uh, it's 1040, so I'm gonna jump in and talk about uh, the Docker cluster registry. Where was that? Yes, thank you. Um, Oh, actually, hold on. Um, let me show you the one we actually created over here. Yeah, that's the one. So this is the one we just created on MailB. Um, I have another one which I've been playing around and showing to my customers outside of this webinar. So in case we want any details around it, I'll go back to that. But for now, this is the one that just came out of the um, cloud formation template that we, that we kicked off, right? So if you've seen the Docker Hub, you will see it has a very similar interface. Uh, there's repositories, there's organizations, users, and stuff, right? So I've created three repos over here, admin, uh, you know, um, uh, sorry, Redis, Ubuntu, and Alpine, under three organizations called admin, anytech, and Kubernetes, right? Um, and then there's organizations, you can actually go, so obviously I've created that. Users, again, um, so, by the way, good thing between UCP and DTR, there is single sign-on. So if you created the users and imported your LDAP at one place, it's gonna be there and you can actually use it over here as well. Um, getting into settings, so this tells you all the settings that you can do. Uh, so obviously we have configured it over here. It automatically comes configured um, talking to an S3 storage in the back end because that's what we configured it to be able to go do. Uh, but if you're using it, you know, elsewhere, or if you're setting it on your phone, and if you have, say, you're running it on-prem, you want to be configuring it with your file system, you can always switch to your file system outside. Not with this template, I'm talking about outside. I'm just trying to be generic over here in terms of explaining what you can do. Same thing, you have an Azure, or if you're using OpenStack Swift, you can do that as well. 
Another big differentiation with Docker Trusted Registry is the concept of garbage collection. Right now, this is because very important because think about this: you have all your developers, all your users who are continuously pushing these images to, and then it's going to start accumulating and it becomes huge after a point. So you can actually configure for garbage collection, which basically means now you simply you can set up a uh, you know however you want to be able to do it. Right, you can set it up for a simple cron, for example. Now if I set it up as so now it's going to run every midnight and it's actually going to go and it's going to go clean up those images which are there in the registry. So this becomes very, very important as well. So again, um, key features, garbage collection, high availability, and, and, and to top it off, the best one is the security story, which is notary and image signing. Now this is a feature that I personally, personally am very, very fond of and I really love it, is the concept of image signing. Um, what does that mean? Basically for security, it's a huge thing, right? What it does is, now I'm a developer, I can sign an image and I can push it to the Docker Trusted Registry. And then you can make sure that only signed images can run inside your entire organization. So this becomes very, very important because now you can actually make sure that somebody's just not pulling an image from Docker Hub and you know, whatever image, because you don't know what's out there, right? You can say for your organization, you can tag as a signed image and you can say, I only want signed images to be running inside my organization. Now, I'm gonna to switch to UCP real quick just for that to show you how you do that is what we were talking about is over here. Now, once you check this, only signed images are gonna become run, right? Now, what are all the advantages of using signing, right? First, you can actually have things like image provenance. So I can actually say things like, sorry, I can actually say things like, if a developer has not signed it, don't run it in test. If a developer and test have not signed it, don't run it in pre-prod. If developer, test, and pre-prod have not signed it, don't run it in production. So you can actually configure that entire thing for, um, for your signing and you can make that work. The second thing is it also prevents under, you know, uh, freshness of the image. So, Harish, I've created an image and I've pushed it, right? Now you're pulling that, now Chris is actually uh, pulling that image. He can verify first that it is actually an image that was created by Harish and not by anybody else. So it actually going to prevent, uh, prevent against a man in middle attack. The second thing it's also going to prevent is timestamp, right? What if somebody took an image that Harish created, say, two and a half to three years back? They could use that too. So it also guarantees the freshness of that image, right? So let's quickly see how an image signing looks like. Um, this is my existing here, and I'm going to show you over here. So as you can see here, once you enable it and you push, it comes with a signed image and it says it was signed by the administrator and uh, the size associated with it, right? Now pushing that is very, very, very simple, right? All you're simply gonna do is, let's see what images I already have here. All right, so I already have a Redis, right? I just pulled it from uh, this one. So what I'm gonna do is, let's say I, I tag Redis with, and I'll, let me explain to you what I'm gonna be doing. So, let's go back here. So, when you actually tag stuff, how do you do it? Um, you're actually gonna be using the name of the DTR. Obviously, um, you wanna throw this behind a name resolution, DNS, a, a, a much easier name. Um, I'm just showing you how exactly it was created just out of the box, but you guys get that. So what? So I'm gonna show you in parallel what's, what I'm doing, right? So I'm taking a Redis image and I'm tagging it and I am pushing it. So I'm basically gonna tag that image with the name of the repository, the name of the organization or the individual, which is admin. So this could have been Initech Ubuntu if I'm using an Ubuntu image, but you guys get the point. Right, so I've tagged it. And now I'm gonna do, actually let's make this faster. I'm actually gonna push this image. So what's actually doing now, is actually pushing this image to the Docker Trusted Registry, right? So once it pushes to the Docker Trusted Registry, now it becomes, uh, again, for this to happen, um, just to let you know, you must have your client to have trusted the DTR, so I've done that process in trusting it, and once I've trusted it, 
um, you know, I, I should be a user to be able to go do this. So I'm an administrator and my node's being trusted, so it's actually going to be pushed, right? So now if you go back here, go to this, it should show that it just says that it was a few seconds ago created by admin. So now you're actually starting with a known state of this. Now, say suppose, and this is the key, right? So basically, once you've enabled content trust, you can only use signed images. So let's try to, I mean, basically we just pushed an image now, which means we should have been able to pull it if we didn't do this, right? Previously, you would have been able to pull it. But now that we've signed the image, and as in what we have done is, we have enabled Docker Content Trust. And if you try pulling that same image, it should fail. Right? You see that? Error contacting notary server, this thing. And that's and that's the thing, right? So now you actually prevented being unsigned images being inside your entire organization. So now the same thing, but in the interest of time, I'm now going to show that is basically if you had done this and then you had tagged it and pushed it, it would have actually asked you for keys to be able to go do it. And then that one you will be able to actually push it. Actually, how much time do we have? Let's see if we can. So I'm so responding to some questions, just because I know we're going to run out of time here. Okay. Keep going. <clears throat> so now we try to... Yeah, so now it's actually signing in me because the trust data was already there, right? So that's how you can actually enable to make sure that only signed images can exist in your in your organization and not uh, use it anywhere else. So signing becomes a very, very important thing. One of the things um, that uh, people actually use this for is, for example, your CI CD pipeline, which uh, uh, Chris, Chris talked about uh, in, in, in the beginning, right, is basically you can have that entire thing of signing as part of your CI CD pipeline configured in your build server with Jenkins and configured with your DTR and UCP. So you can make sure that through that entire flow, you can actually verify that those signing happens before it actually gets pushed. So we talked about signing, we talked about LDAP and Active Directory, we talked about garbage collection, and we talked about setting it up in HA. Um, similarly, that's the UCP cluster over here. And every time you get a newer version, it tells you that the new one exists. I deliberately kept it so you guys can actually go see it. So that's uh, DDC for you. Um, and then coming back to our stack over here, as you guys can see, uh, go back to stacks. Um, anything else you want to tell you? Cloudflare, uh, we talked about being able to SSH. And these are the things that it actually created. So you see here, um, just in terms of resources, just to let you know what actually creating it here, load balancers, and uh, creates individual subnets. It creates a, a separate VPC for this and configures them on it. That's the load balancer, and uh, let's hear this one. Cool. We can take questions now. Yeah, sure. Um, do you have the ability to see some of the questions? I'm just gonna oh, sure. Let me, let me. One more slide and um, just. Yeah, closing. I can bring up the questions on the side, yeah. Uh, let me see. Like one of the questions that came up was, um, yeah, how does the resource allocation work? Like, is there a way that you can, can we over allocate CPU or RAM? Um, yeah, so basically the resource allocation, yeah, I mean, it's basically whatever you set on it, right? Um, so um, there are some uh, few things we've actually also uh, modified it in the uh, newer engine of 113 that went out, but pretty much you can actually say, how much you want to be able to configure for that specific container, and it's not going to go above that, right? Um, so you, it sets it to that limit and configures your containers to be used for that, that CPU uh, RAM limit which you're setting up over there. Um, one of the questions we got was, are you going to go through the difference between what um, DDC provides and ECS provides? I know oh. we don't have a ton of time here, but there's a couple like key maybe areas that we could highlight. Sure. Um, I mean, uh, bottom line is, uh, first of all, uh, you know, 
this is a Docker native solution. It talks 100% Docker native APIs, right? That's a, that's a very big differentiation between us and and, uh, and anybody else in the market for that matter. So Compose, all those components will work out of the box because it talks 100% APIs. The second big thing is um, if you always see um, uh, the last I checked, ECS is based off the 111 engine. Docker 111 engine went out uh, last March or last April, right? Um, we are actually in 113 engine, which went out last week. That's about eight to nine months of work uh, that's no longer there as part of the container service. So all the, comp co the, the, the parts of Docker service that I showed you doesn't even exist in 111 engine. The internal load balancer, that doesn't exist in the engine. Uh, Swarm, that doesn't exist in the engine. So you're always going to be behind those components across it. And the big, big thing is the security piece, right? I mean, you have granular role-based authentication and control, Active Directory Sync. I mean, signing and scanning that's coming up pretty soon next week, um, which where every push you do, there is going to be a scanning service that's going to run. And secrets, right? That's another thing we've added in the 113 engine, if you're following it, is the concept of secrets. Because previously, usernames and passwords will actually have to be stored either in the Docker file or you have to send them as part of an environment variable. And that, that kind of sucks, right? So we've actually built that into the engine itself and that becomes a part of the next UCP will actually have a secrets management tab itself which is coming out next week. So pretty much all the functionality and, and if most of you are on this call, you guys all get that how fast an ecosystem Docker is and how fast it's actually moving. Nine months of work is a lot. So all those functionality, you're never going to get that as well. The third thing is ECS is very, very specific and restrictive only to Amazon, right? Tomorrow, if you want to take your workloads out of Amazon and you want to put it somewhere else, I mean, if you have put your life on Amazon and everything is there and you're okay with a, a year or a year and a half of this, and the things like security and internal load balance don't matter for you or something, yeah, I would say go ahead and try it out with, with uh, ECS. But if you build the application, you want to build it to be independent of any anything, right? You want to be independent of Amazon. You want to be independent of Azure, independent of OpenStack. You want to be able to move those images and those containers anywhere and everywhere you want. And that's where, you know, UCP and DTR come into the picture because, like I showed you, all it cares about is a node. A node is a node which is another VM or a physical server with running an engine. I could technically have another uh, engine on um, Azure, I could have one on Google Cloud, and I could have one on Amazon, and I can create a cluster out of that. Or most of the time when seeing enterprises, they have a hybrid environment. They have a private data center. They also have uh, a few instances they're using up on Amazon which they want to be able to use. So they can actually go and get into it. Um, I know I've been, thank you very much sure, for that. Um, and we can take a couple more questions. I did get a question around the monthly pricing. So one of the questions was, is the 150 per month per instance, in the case of the AWS, yes it is. Now we offer monthly as well as annual. And the slide I'm showing right here is basically the three ways you can get Docker Data Center today. Uh, we offer a free 30-day trial. So um, I'll show you the link to that in one second. Um, also, you can do uh, 1,500 per node, so in your case per instance per year, or 3,000 per instance per year, just based on the SLAs that you're actually going for as well. Um, so. I know this is the Docker Con slide again. What we want to do is take a couple more questions. I know there's a ton that came in. So let's look at it again. Yeah, so uh, I, I am uh, going from the last. Uh, for example, I noticed the cloud formation template mentioned it shouldn't be used for production. Does it mean it's not ready for production use or does production need to be done manually? Absolutely not. Um, basically, there's, there's, there's two parts to this, right? UCP DTR is the actual product. Cloud formation template is one way of actually going and provisioning it. That being said, UCP DTR is a solution which is called as Docker Data Center, like Chris mentioned, is being used in production uh, by, I mean, name any customer, right? We, I mean, obviously we can't talk about all the customer names, but some of those who came out in public and for, for example, ADP, GE, they're all already using this in production. Um, so yes, definitely we're ready for it um, uh, uh, for consumption. Um, one of the questions I came up with around um, is your solution similar to orchestration tools like in the marketplace like Kubernetes? So one of the things we like to kind of have people focus on is the overall platform itself, right? So orchestration is a component within the platform, right? So in our case, it would be Swarm, 
All right, so we leverage Swarm, but it's not it's not the platform itself, right? We have the registry component, we have the container management um, component, we have Swarm, which is built into the engine. But we want people to really focus on not comparing kind of orchestration versus orchestration, but um, what's the best enterprise container management platform that I trust to start running my containerized applications in production? Yep, good point. Um, the, one of the questions was, can an existing Swarm infrastructure be brought brought under UCP management? Um, great question. Not currently. Um, currently, we have where um, it will have to be managed uh, by UCP. But if you do have, a, actually, let me take that back. If your Swarm is based off of the new 112 uh, and it's running the new 112 engine and it's already there, you can just take that as a node and then we just do a node join and add it to the UCP cluster, and yes, you can manage it. So yes, you can do it. Um, what other? Um, Sorry, know, there was a question from Clint around um, the status of services once deployed. The question was, does the status always match creation time? If so, why? So um, no, because at this, at a, if you look at it, if you know a container is running or is paused or stopped, we'll be able to show that. Like it's basically real time. Um, what the status of the container it is. It's not just going to show green because when it started, it was green, right? It, it kind of updates throughout the life cycle of the container itself. So just wanted to clarify right. that. Yep. Um, so one question we got, and Harish, I think maybe you'd be best for this one. I know we're coming up in the hour, but how do you do deployment test automation for rolling upgrades? Oh, um, so basically rolling upgrades, uh, like, like the one I showed you, right, where you can actually go set up and um, have them updated at a specific time over a period of time, how much delay you want to be able to go do that, et cetera. Now, typically, the uh, in terms of deployment, I mean, obviously, you go through the CI, CD cycle as well, which you want to be able to set, um, which is the slide that um, Chris joined first. Um, we've actually um, documented uh, fully how to go to the CI, CD pipeline as well. Uh, uh, we have in our in our uh, Docker website, it has the link which explains it. So you can just follow the instructions as is. We have the images there as well, which you can go set it up to spin up your uh, CI CD deployment. And with that, you can also have rolling update. You can also do green blue deployments if you want. Um, uh, that can that is also supported, which you can use uh, with an, with another external HA. Um, and the last question, I guess we can take here is: sure. um, People have asked uh, multiple people now: Is this presentation recorded? So yes. This whole presentation has been recorded, and on Monday what I'm going to do is send this out to everyone who has registered here, um, so you'll be able to take another listen at this, um, kind of walk through it at your own pace. I know we covered a lot here, but um, absolutely, you'll be able to do that and share it with anyone that you like. Um, I know we're at the hour now. Is there maybe one more that we want to take that maybe you saw, um, Harish, or if not, I guess it's a good point to close out. No, that's good. All right. Um, I think what we'll do is maybe we can create like a follow-up blog or something uh, where we can capture a lot of the questions that we didn't cover here. Again, I appreciate everyone for taking the time to be here and, and hear about Docker Data Center for AWS. Hopefully it was helpful. Um, if you want to trial it, again, just go to www.docker.com backslash trial. Um, again, another shameless plug for DockerCon. If you're interested in DockerCon and seeing more about some of the technology that we're building out here and that we're going to be releasing to the market and what it means to your enterprise, um, do uh, come and attend. It's April 17th through the 20th. Again, as a, as a thank you for y'all being here, um, we're offering a 10% kind of off um, coupon for the early bird special. So it's cheap already or cheaper already, and it will be even more cheaper with uh, the promo code, which is high. So again, thank you. Uh, we highly recommend you go out and try out Docker Data Center for AWS. Um, we're here if you have any more questions, and keep an eye out for um, all of the recording and, and email that comes out on Monday or Tuesday. So thank you, Harish, as well, for being here. Yep. Thank you very much, Chris. And thank you all for joining. Um, yeah. Like you said, we have it all. We appreciate it. Thank you, everyone in the audience. Um, appreciate the love. Have a great day.